Childs and uh, Brian Nichols. Um, we're going to start with uh, Dan Childs. He's the senior agricultural consultant in the producer relations program at the Noble uh, Research Institute, where he serves as an agricultural economist. Uh, he joined the Noble Research Institute staff in 1978, back when it was the, the Noble Foundation. Um, before he was there, he spent three years with the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service and a short time with the USDA. Uh, Dan is a veteran of the U.S. Army, and he grew up in Pontotoc County near Roth. Uh, Dan, thank you for your service, and, and very excited to hear what you have to say about the markets and, and what we're looking at uh, for cattle production this fall. Thank you, Paul. Uh, again, thanks for the invitation, Paul. We appreciate this opportunity very much. It's, uh, you know, it's been a, a disruptive year uh, in a lot of ways this year to our personal lives as well as our, our businesses, uh, especially in agriculture and especially in livestock. We've experienced unprecedented issues, I think, and uh, still feeling some of the lingering effects of that, I believe. And as we contemplate retained ownership or a winter stalker enterprise. Uh, first, I'd like to kind of talk about some of the headwinds uh, that we'll be experiencing uh, as we move forward uh, into the into the winter and uh, into next next spring. I think one of the first things I talk about here is is uh, <clears throat> drought. Uh, and I know Brian, he'll uh, bring us up to date on Western Oklahoma a little bit later in the program. But as you look west and southwest of Oklahoma, you see uh, you see a lot of dark areas, and uh, it's having an impact on cattle producers in those areas. It's my understanding there's a lot of a lot of producers in New Mexico that's uh, not only selling all their calves but uh, dipping into their cow herd as well, and so is. As this happens, you know, it increases the, the supply of calves on the market. Uh, probably doesn't help our uh, our cull cow market either. And so uh, just uh, re remember that, that even though where you're at, uh, drought may not be as big an issue uh, as it is in the west and the southwest, but, but they are having... Uh, terrible difficulties. I talked to a gentleman this morning up in Nebraska, and he said uh, he had received two inches of snow out of this event, and that's the first precip they had received since July. So uh, there's there's areas where drought is really a big issue. So again, uh, one of the headwinds that we'll be looking at uh, in the in the stocker enterprise as we go forward and and how the the movement of those of cattle in those drought areas uh, happen in the in the future that it could uh, uh, negatively impact our our prices here. Also, uh, on our might say cost of production, we've got uh, impacts of the the shortage of forage where hay prices. Uh, other hay, not counting alfalfa, has uh, been elevated above the 2019 year as well as the five-year average, considerably lower than that. So, uh, you know, if you're uh, if you've got plenty of hay, feel blessed because that's uh, uh, not the case in e everywhere. And so, the implications of uh, kind of what's been been happening there is. Uh, uh, Look at our uh, corn uh, corn charts. Where just a month ago or so, the World Ag Supply and Demand Estimate come out with USDA indicating lower lower acreage uh, to be harvested, uh, lowered the yield a little bit, and the market futures market responded. And you can see since roughly in uh, uh, middle of August or so. It's been a pretty strong movement upward uh, to where we've got uh, corn above four bucks now. That's the futures market. Here's the here's the cash out of Omaha. So again, just bumping on that four dollar market, 
uh, which impacts calf and feeder prices uh, directly when uh, when we see corn prices move like that. A uh, little bit of a uh, of a question mark here is is the, this is April live cattle. Uh, you can see going back to early October here uh, that. Uh, the decline we've seen. Uh, it's, it's nice to see a little bit of green on the charts where we got the last movement there. And I think this is as of the close of business on Monday or Tuesday, I'm sorry. So uh, we have seen a little bit upward movement and, and a little more since then. But uh, really, corn prices shouldn't impact uh, this very much. I, 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 uh, I like say it's, it's uh, the analysts that I read and uh, uh, look toward uh, what their opinions are really don't have much of a, a reason for this this decline here. I think it makes a lot more sense here with these feeder cattle when you've got the when you got the corn market uh, performing like it is, and then the the fed, distant Fed markets. We can see that that feeder cattle uh, really can be justifiably lower, uh, and so. Uh, it's been unfortunate in a way that a lot of these summer yearlings coming off in September, October uh, has experienced a much, much lower market and seemed like the last three or four weeks, especially, uh, you get the market reports out of El Reno and Oklahoma City and, you know, they're two to eight lower, seems like every week. And so you can see that uh, uh, displayed here in the in the futures market. <clears throat> so, so. In addition to that, if you look at the percent that a a feeder animal, seven to eight weight steer, is of a of a of a, of a stalker calf, <clears throat> you can see this line in the in the middle there on the red is the almost a 20 year average there from 01 through 2020. The information we have so far, and it runs about 88 percent, which means that. The, the 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 March feeder cattle seven eight weight steer runs about eighty percent of the November stalker calf price. And you can see back in the middle of uh, uh, the second decade here in 11, 10, 11, 12, you know pretty strong years. You got fourteen. We can all remember how good a year that was. Uh, Seventeen. Again, those are years when the when the feeder market uh, was above the average uh, historical average as a percent of the five to six weight calf. And as you extend that on out and look at the very extreme right of that chart, we're looking at 2020 uh, there that you can see that that. Uh, that margin is not near near as attractive to a winter stalker program. Uh, right now, uh, if you calculated that, it's about 86%. And so we'd, we'd like for it to be higher than that in order to get us a, a, a favorable uh, margin between buying a November calf and selling a March uh, feeder, feeder cat animal. So... Uh, Another headwind here is our feed yard break-even numbers. The red line here, as you can see, is the uh, projected cost of gain, and the blue line is, is cash prices. And so you can see in recent weeks that the cash market has been below uh, break-evens, and it's ex 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 forecast to go uh, uh, cost of gain to, to go back up with this $4 corn. And so, uh, again, another headwind that feed yards would like to buy uh, feeders cheaper. Uh, so that makes it difficult uh, for the market to move much higher. <clears throat> with, with the headwinds we've discussed here, uh, here, here is a, a, a budget uh, for winter stockers that you can uh, look at for mainly the, the methodology rather than, than the actual prices, although I hope they're not too far out of line. But uh, <clears throat> again, if you start with a 500 pound steer, Oklahoma City last week cost you a buck 54 to buy that animal, uh, $770 vet uh, and treatment. And of course, you know, this is anybody's guess. Most of us have a pretty good idea of what 
uh, processing fees costs. Uh, some of us like to give a medical access, some of us don't. Uh, usually, uh, if you do not give medical access, the treatment's higher uh, and vice versa. Uh, so you're receiving feed and hay at 1% feed, 2% hay, uh, 28 bucks death loss. Might should be higher than that, especially with the weather we've had in the last three or four days. Uh, but figuring a, a, a preconditioning a weight after preconditioning, a uh, pound a day, so they weigh 530 when they go to wheat, two pounds a day for five months, uh, salt and mineral two ounces a day, risk management, uh, buying a put. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, shortly. I have to keep moving here. Uh, interest at four and a half, that may be, may be higher than what some are, are paying. Uh, labor at 15 cents per head per day, so that gives us 1,070. Uh, so our cost of gain for 330 pounds using these numbers is 91 cents. Value of gain using the futures uh, indicated price for next May. Uh, it's a little higher than this right, right now with the last couple of days of uh, action, uh, but about 93 bucks. So you see, just based on this budget, uh, that the margin's pretty tight. Right now, you might think, well, the you know the juice is not worth the squeeze here. Uh, if this was the best we could expect, <clears throat> but let's talk about some things that we we may could change what this looks like. And I would I would say if you look at this chart, this is cattle auction comparisons in the state of Oklahoma that are reported by the Agricultural Marketing Service. So this is public information. Uh, on uh, here's five different sales, uh, Adel, Reno, McAllister, Oklahoma National, and Woodward uh, for a five to 550 pound steer. And you can see here from almost any given week that, that the, the, there could be a 10 to $15 difference in the price of this animal, depending on where you buy it at. And I know uh, when I personally go to buy, buy calves, uh, I generally don't buy them out of Oklahoma City. I'll buy them at sale barns in, in uh, southeastern Oklahoma, northeast Texas. Uh, usually get them bought, you know, ten to fifteen dollars uh, lower than Oklahoma City. So, so immediately, if you look at this uh, five hundred pound steer to dollar fifty four, uh, talking to some order buyers that buy locally in southeast Oklahoma, they thought they could buy, you know, the last week. They could have bought that steer for a dollar forty. So uh, again, just shop around, uh, be uh, cognizant of maybe where the opportunities are. Uh, you might say, well, if you buy a local sale barns one at a time, you got more sickness, you're going to treat the cost, death loss is going to be higher, and that that could be true. Uh, you, you know, you just have to weigh those options as you make that decision. And again, as we look at the, the larger animals, if uh, we got them ready next spring, again, look at <coughs> excuse me, look at the differences here that we have in any given week, depending on where you market that animal. So when it comes sales time, again, instead of uh, selling that animal here uh, maybe for a dollar thirty, uh, and that's a basis Oklahoma City, which is probably one of the the, the better part places to market. Think about maybe going up there instead of instead of selling them at a local sale barn, or uh, maybe you can can do better selling them private treaty on the on the farm. So all of those are options, but I just simply uh, mention this as some some opportunities and and some uh, rather than just kind of talking about doom and despair that we did earlier on what the headwinds are. That here's some positive things that we can we can do to. Uh, to, to change the outcome of that budget somewhat. <clears throat> now here's something if I showed you, if, if you remember one, one slide, uh, I would say this is the slide to, to remember here because there's actually about three of them here. Uh, but this is, this is all the fourth quarters going back to 2000, what beef demand is. And for those of you that's been in the market, uh, in the industry for a while, if you, if you could recall, if you, this chart was from 1980 through 1998, it would be a it would be a linear line going from the from the 
uh, top of the left hand side down to the bottom of the right hand slide. I mean, we lost we lost beef demand during that 18 year period. But now, since then, uh, going forward, actually the fourth quarter of 2019 was the highest uh, beef demand index we've had, uh, you might say, in the last 20 years. So that's uh, it, it's just been amazing to me, and I think most people in the industry, how strong beef demand ha- has been. And, of course, this is pre-COVID. This is pre-COVID. So let's jump in and look at, well, what's happened maybe since COVID? Well, here's the first quarter of 2020. Uh, again, very uh, of course, it had January, February is involved in this, but again, very strong beef demand. Uh, again, some some opportunity we may look look toward uh, as as favorable. <clears throat> uh, second quarter, so we were we're well into COVID. Uh, so what's going on with beef demand at that time? So you look here again on the right, uh, second quarter 2020. So this would be April, May, June. Uh, equal to going back to 2004, still yet very strong beef demand. So, you know, if you if you if you consider these things, wh- whenever we start to exit COVID and and restaurants start opening back up and we start traveling more, uh, I think uh, this is a, a something that could be very supportive of cattle prices. Now, is it gonna is it gonna happen before we need to sell these winter stockers? Next May, uh, as yearlings, it, you know that remains to be be seen. But uh, I think that it provides uh, reasoning to think that we've got maybe more upside potential than we do downside uh, going going forward. Something else I think looks favorable is uh, beef cow replacements. You can see for the last uh, four years we've kept fewer beef replacements, uh, and uh, if you look at heifer slaughter. Uh, again, very high, much higher than the, the five-year average from 14 to 18, uh, right along there with, with 2019. So the herd is actually uh, uh, declining instead of building, and which, again, should support uh, prices going forward. <clears throat> so if you look at beef cow slaughter, again, uh, very high. So an indication as we look at these uh, that that herd – uh, liquidation uh, will continue uh, in in 2020. And looking just kind of back at their old cattle cycle, it's normally nine to ten. Uh, of course, this one from 1990 to 04 was the longest at 14 years. You look up here in the mid 60s, uh, 67, 79. We peaked at all time high cattle numbers uh, in 1975. We'll probably not ever experience that again, but here we are, this heavy blue line in the middle uh, for 2014 into 20. We've uh, kind of peaked out a couple of years ago and we're heading downhill, which is typically uh, we'll experience the, the uh, strong cattle prices each year going forward. Uh, last thing on maybe uh, Optimistic things to look forward to is uh, this size of our calf crop with the herd declining. It's going down, and so uh, we'll have less calves to work with uh, in the future, I think, as this cow herd continues to decline. So that's kind of what I had on the, on uh, retained ownership or winter stalker uh, enterprises for this year. Uh, I think as most of the time in our business, uh, you kind of got to be optimistic you got to bet on the come a little bit very seldom can we you know buy a calf put him on the board and uh lock in much much margin and that i mean sometimes you can and you just have to always be uh uh be watching and and looking when that when that happens if uh paul asked just to touch base a little bit on risk management tools try to, to continue forward here and i realize this is going pretty fast but uh, we don't have a lot of time here. We want to get as much covered as we can, but uh, it's the cash forward contracting uh, is always a popular, and and uh, most people feel very comfortable with that. Uh, there's a lot of reasons to do that. You know, you're you're in control of price. You know what you're going to get before they leave the farm. Uh, you're in control of shrink. Uh, <clears throat> the downside I would say to this is that if the, if you're contracting out very far. Uh, then there's always a question about uh, what's the cattle going to gain 
sometimes you, you know a lot of a lot of these buyers now are putting 50 pound stops and so if you contract them for seven and a half and it's been a good spring uh cattle are gonna gonna weigh eight and a quarter well you, you know you just give away that last 25 pounds there so i i would my philosophy is it's, it's a it's a cash forward contracting is a very good alternative i i think a a, a producer a seller has to be uh well informed in order to make that work for him <clears throat> of course many of you are familiar with just uh hedging the cattle uh buying a i'm sorry selling a, a futures contract this case would be a May, in our example, a, a May feeder cattle contract. Of course, all of us know uh, the, the worrisome and emotional uh, uh, impacts of getting margin calls and the fact that, that we have to live with, well, if the market went up, uh, like in 2014 from summer to fall, you think, man, you, you know, I could have sold those cattle for $10 more. Of course, this this spring, if you had had uh, your cattle hedged uh, and saw the market go down twenty bucks a hundred, you think, boy, you know this is a good deal. So uh, it's a it's a viable tool. You just uh, have to be sure you understand uh, the margin calls and be in a position to be able to meet those if you want to stay hedged uh, throughout the process. <clears throat> Options uh, again, very very. Uh, attractive uh, to some people because once you pay the premium uh, you, you don't have to worry about margin calls it basically sets a floor uh, under your uh, uh, under the price for the cattle and many people in order to try to cheapen that uh, premium up uh, they'll sell a call in concert with buying the put uh, you know anytime we sell an option you got to margin that uh, and so if the market did go up you're going to have to margin that call because you're on the short side of that. Uh, but it does uh, generate some some revenue up front when you make that decision. Uh, it's not on this slide, but uh, you could put another line under that and sell a call uh, to say selling a put. <clears throat> what some people will do will will uh, you know they'll look at their strike price. <clears throat> Excuse me. You might say that's a that's a buck forty. So we'll go up at uh, 150, we'll sell a call, we'll go down to 130 and sell a put. And so we can, we receive revenue for both of those. But again, if the market moves more than $10 up or down, well then, you, you know, it's gonna take away from your dollar forty price. So so uh, just uh, uh, be aware of that. But but all these are very popular, used by, by uh, several people. The last thing on risk management tools is this livestock risk protection. It's not a new pro it's not new. It's been around, I know, for at least 20 years. I can remember it being uh, operable uh, in 2003 when the when the cow stole Christmas, uh, and because it actually uh, they closed it down because some, it got overloaded that that evening when the when the because it didn't close until like eight or nine o'clock at night and. Uh, and the news broke at four or five o'clock in the afternoon after the CME had closed, and uh, they just overwhelmed, overloaded the system, and it locked it up. And and they and of course they didn't open it back up. But uh, <clears throat> just a highlight of this, and the reason I mention this is they've changed some things that makes it a lot more attractive than it was before. Uh, you know, again, it's it's like PRF insurance. Uh, crop insurance, you buy that from a private agent, even though it's uh, kind of sponsored by the risk management agency from USDA. You can only buy insurance uh, for the, for a certain number of, of weeks. You choose this. Uh, year starts July 1, so it would start 13 weeks and from uh, <clears throat> July 1 and go on fr from there. Feeder, ca feeder cattle type, you know, steers and bulls under six, only steers above six to nine. Heifers, uh, two different weight ranges, uh, Brahmin cattle, uh, heifers, steers, and bulls under six, and heifers and steers above six, no bulls, predominantly dairy. Uh, pretty much the same thing. You can you can insure up to twelve thousand a year on one one endorsement, which is which 
is the reason some people uh, are attracted to this is, is that if you had 13 head, you could buy an endorsement for it. Or if you had 5,700 head, you could do, this, do the same thing here. So one to 6,000 head, it does not have to be a 50,000 uh, pound load increment in order to do that. And right here is probably one of the biggest things uh, that's changed and I, I think is, is uh, uh, makes it much more attractive than it was because when it first started out, the coverage hadn't changed, but the premium subsidy, when it first started out, it was subsidized at 13%. <clears throat> uh, late, the, late summer, uh, RMA made the decision to, uh, to increase that from 35 uh, to 55%. And you can see here uh, that the subsidy uh, changes depending on what level of coverage. If it's at the top, uh, it's, it's more at the lower end of the subsidy, 35. But if your coverage is 70 to 79, 80%, uh, then you know you get more than half of the premium paid for. So uh, I, I'm not recommending it, but I'm just saying it's another tool in, the, in your tool bag that you can use, and uh, I think many of us are are uh, um, more aware of the need for risk management after what happened during COVID in this spring, and so I just offer this as a piece of information that maybe you'd heard of it in the past and say, well, you, you know, it's too high to buy, uh, subsidies low, you, you, you know, you, you, you can do better with just buying a put, selling a call, et cetera, and so, uh, and it still may still may be the case, but I would just say revisit this if you've got a an insurance agent that you know that handles this, uh, it may be worth checking back back in with them uh, because if you if you get uh, let me just mention back here is that it's it's the it's settled against the the CME feeder cattle index uh, published daily. It's not what you sell cattle for. It's not uh, the futures price. It's it's uh, it's that feeder price index. <clears throat> and if the level you uh, bought insurance for is below that, then you'll get an indemnity and you have to file for that. Uh, if you got on the cattle up to 30 days, which is kind of a, maybe a, uh, a downer for some people because if, you know, if you get in a drought, you think, well, I, I really need to sell these cattle earlier. Or if you got a head in the market and you think, well, you know, I can I can sell this put back and collect money, or same with a with a futures contract. You cannot do this uh, with with LR, LRP. Uh, but it, again, you don't have to sell the cattle at the end of the contract. So, last slide here is is that I would just encourage you to remember that as you look at uh, risk management, that you don't forget about the basis. Uh, that you might be disappointed if you if you say, well, I can get a dollar thirty, uh, <clears throat> but whatever local area you're selling into may have a you know a negative basis, and so you would get something under that. So be aware of the basis impact on a risk management uh, structure as you go go there. So, uh, Paul, I'm going to turn it back to you, and uh, here's my contact information if you're interested. I don't know if you got any questions during the process or not. <clears throat> Sorry, I had to, didn't un unmute myself. Uh, okay. I do not see any questions in the in the chat, but thank you very much. That's an excellent overview. And and um, several years ago when prices were, were peaking, um, in 2015 or 14, and I was, you know, talking to some cattle feeders, and you know, the question was, well, is this price we're seeing in the futures real? And uh, <laughs> the the answer that was given by another guy was, well, if you lock them in, then they are real. So yeah. Yeah. That applies as well whenever we have these, you know, black swan events like the COVID or or something else. Yeah. If we have some risk protection in place. It's you know really valuable and, and uh, exceptionally helpful to get a good night's sleep or or to keep your <laughs> wife you know happy with you. Um, yeah, it just it works it works the other way around when you get those margin calls. It's uh, sometimes mama. It's hard to explain that to her. <laughs> <laughs> That's true too. Um, but that brings us with uh, up to uh, Brian Nichols. Um, he's a 
producer in, in Western Oklahoma. I'll introduce it in a second, but he does an excellent job, very pro progressive as far as risk management and uh, you know, as a stalker operator. So Brian Nichols is uh, with Nichols Family Farms out in the Sentinel Burns Flat area in Western Oklahoma. He graduated from Cameron University in 08, um, and then he went to Montana State to uh, get a master's of animal and range sciences in, in 2010. Uh, he spent seven years uh, with the uh, Noble uh, Foundation in Ardmore, which is now the Noble Research Institute, as a research associate and livestock consultant. Uh, just three years ago, he returned back to the family operation and uh, where they grow stalker cattle, triticale, wheat, and cotton. So with that, Brian, uh, really appreciate you taking the time to coming on to our uh, meeting today, and I'll open it up for you to kind of talk about your program and your how you work risk management into that. Thanks, Paul. I appreciate you inviting me to do this. Um, so I'll kind of the... I'll try to walk through some of the things that we do, some of the products that uh, we use, uh, how we go about making some decisions, uh, run through a little bit of a budget that I'd put together that'd be similar to Dan's and, and maybe talk about a couple of the differences, which he's already kind of highlighted. And, and hopefully anybody out there as we're going through this, um, chime in with any questions and comments, they'd be greatly appreciated. So. Um, to, to start off with, you know, there's, there's three products that I really rely on pretty heavily in order to help make decisions on the Stalker cattle in. Um, one is a program that's called Stalker One. Uh, it's a software uh, program that we started using last year that enables me to keep up with, with all the cattle that we have, um, and especially the, on the cost end. Uh, it's really easy to, to round our numbers and, and, and just kind of try to get them close, but I think it's pretty important to, to really nail them down sometimes. And, and one instance of where that's incredibly important is when we start talking about, you know, do we, do we buy this calf or not? And a lot of times, depending on the time of the year, like Dan said, where that 1% death loss, maybe that should be a five or an eight in some times of the year, whereas maybe it's a zero in other times. And so, um, you know, if we always just work off of the average for the entire year, we may come out okay in the end, but we might be able to do ourselves some good if we have a little bit better data to go off of for those different times of the year. Um, the second one is cattle market mobile. Uh, it's an app that I have on my phone that is, is very, very handy, very intuitive, easy to get to all of the market reports, uh, as well as your futures uh, quotes. And so that one is one that I look at several times a day. The third one that I use a lot uh, is Top Third Ag Marketing's website. Uh, there's multiple websites out there to help you with your futures quotes and things like that. But it, it's one that my dad had always used and got me to use it. And the main reason I use it is for our options quotes. Um, it's a website where you can go see what the options quotes are uh, and, and you know, try to look at those types of decisions. So, um, you know, if we, if we talk, I'll, I'll, first thing I'll probably do is go over the budget that I'd kind of put together. Um, so, so the, 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 price that I went off of was a 425 pound calf at McAllister this week um, and the the market showed them at a dollar 40 61 so that's 605 dollars for that calf the one thing I'll say there is and McAllister is a barn that we buy out of quite a bit but um, we haven't these past couple of weeks um, but but what what is reported is not always what it takes to buy that calf in a barn sometimes. Uh, I think they do as good a job as they can, but there's a, there's a, you know, depending on when they're in the barn or when they're not and who took a, who took a break for lunch or what all these different things that go on, uh, we can use these market reports as kind of a, you know, a, they, they get as close, 
but we got to we got to have order buyers or we got to be in the barn to really know what that calf's going to cost so so anyways but that's a, a $605 purchasing cost that was what it'd take me to get it laid in based on that um, I put $115 in starting costs that's the $40 in medicine um, like I had $50 in um, $50 in hay and feed um, I had another little figure there. That's what it came up to. Uh, my interest cost I put in is $15. And then I had uh, $134 in pasture costs. I think I used a little lesser value than Dan did on what cost of gain was gonna be on pasture. Um, one thing, I, the thing I didn't add in was labor or yardage. Um, I typically look at those as more of a fixed cost item. That um, so I'm, that I'm not going to put in on the on my partial budget. Um, so so I ended up coming out with uh, those were my starting costs. I was going to sell that calf on the April board uh, yesterday when I did these numbers. The board was at 131.10. Uh, I usually back that up about nine dollars for an 850 pounder. Uh, so to 122.10. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the big thing is it comes out where I was, that calf makes $169. Um, now, if you went and you, you hedge that animal, then, you know, that's $169 in profit. And, and this is where it comes into the risk management conversation. Um, is that a good number to you or not? And, and that is risk management is a very, very personal decision. Um, I might be a little bit more risk averse than you. You may be more risk averse than me. Um, the main thing is that everybody kind of knows who they are and what allows them to sleep tonight. And, uh, and the other thing is, is that it's one thing to do these partial budgets and say, well, cattle make money or cattle don't make money. But in, when, in an operation, we can't just make decisions based off of one partial budget. Essentially, it's got to have to go into a cash flow for the entire operation for, because we op, you operate an operation. You don't just buy a calf and make money off of the calf. Um, that cash flow is going to help you look at all of the costs involved, machinery, everything. Uh, that's where we, we take into account our labor, um, any maintenance we were doing on pens, things of that sort. And so I, I'd say, I just stress, it's really, really important to look at that, look at these numbers in the context of a cash flow statement uh, to see how the operation can do for, for the entire year. Um, so, but if we have, if I, if I have that budget um, and, and I'm thinking, well, what are some things that I can do different? It's like Dan said, the, we can we can tweak some things. We can change the type of cattle that we're looking to buy, what we want to spend on those cattle, how much money we think we can make on those. Another thing is timing. For us, it has been an absolutely terrible fall in terms of health outcomes. Um, it's it's been a very very tough one. And so so do we need to manage our risk um, in terms of maybe changing that timing of when we're buying those cattle. Maybe we can't handle that onslaught of, of sickness uh, during a certain time. Um, another thing it'd be, you know, just like the thing, the, the weather we just went through, shelters and wind breaks and, and bedding and all these kinds of things, they're not the typical way that we think of managing risk, but they absolutely do that. They're, they're helping us manage production risk. And our production risk is just as big of a risk as is our financial risk when we come to, when we talk about pricing cattle and things. So um, those are things that, you, that we need to be looking at as we transition on to the, the financial risk part of it on the pricing, um, you know, forward contracting. We, we do use some forward contracting. One of the biggest things that, um, that can be very tough is is getting the weight right on those cattle um 
We, a lot of people tend to want to go on the lower end, say, oh, those cattle will gain two pounds a day. Well, what if they gain two six? Uh, that's another uh, avenue where we need to keep good records and really know kind of year in, year out, what our average is on gain and what our top and our bottom is as well. Uh, know what the variation is around that average. Um, the, the way that we typically like to use the forward contract is maybe just on a portion. Um, so like this last year, there was some, some uh, forward contracting opportunities that we really liked presented in November and December. And so, you know, instead of going out and forward contracting 12 loads, maybe you do three loads or four loads. Um, and, and knowing that you have lots of uh, variation out there among those cattle, and it allows you as you get closer to that shipping or delivery time, that now you can go in, you can start doing your sorting, and you can get your weight right uh, in order to, to, make, to make the most money possible on that contract. If you got a bunch of big cattle, maybe they don't go on that contract. You save them back and market them a different way. And so uh, allows you to hone in a little bit better on, on using the forward contract. The other thing about a forward contract is, is in, you know, Dan, I've heard Dan talk about this before too, is essentially in that avenue, you're, you're kind of laying the risk off on somebody else and they don't always do that for free. <laughs> so if you're going to, if somebody wants to take that forward contract, they're gonna have to do some risk management on their end too. And so it might cost you a couple of bucks to do that because they're going to want it. They're going to have to pay for their risk management strategy on the, on the other end. Um, the, the just straight hedging, uh, we do some straight hedging. We do, we do several different things that I'll kind of go through here, you know, on a, on a straight hedge boy, last fall, when you could uh, margin a calf up to $600 or so, you know, how much more do you need? That was kind of our stance on it. And so we did some straight hedging on those, those uh, really, really good margins uh, because honestly, we were very happy with, with what that calf could make. Um, you know, now that we're getting into um, these um, little bit, the numbers crunch a little bit tougher, a little tighter margins this year, then we're, prob we're probably gonna look for some upside. And so one, one avenue that we've used before is maybe you, um, we've, we've hedged a set of cattle. We really thought the cattle were going down and maybe, and if they did, then you can go out and then you can buy a call to open your top side back up. And that's a way to uh, get some, get your ceiling raised over with a hedge that the cattle are essentially priced. Um, if we go on the, on the other options route with puts or, uh, you know, the deal with puts anymore is um, they're incredibly expensive, especially if you're at the money. Uh, so yesterday when I was looking at an April put at $1.30 at the money, that, that put would cost $6.85 a hundred. You know, so seven bucks times, hey, that's 50. If you, if you just went a straight put, that's a $56 ahead risk management cost there which, you know, most people can't stomach that. Um, and so, so the way to cheapen that up maybe is to go out and, and sell the call. Um, we usually like to work on about a $10 window. Um, and so an April 140 call, you could have made 362 back on that. So, so you now you brought your, your risk management cost down to 322. Um, now we're talking that's a little bit, little bit easier to stomach. Um, so on that calf that I talked about, you know, that was, uh, we bought for $605 in that budget. We take him out to April. Um, where that really comes in is that if you, if, if we did our, our put and call strategy there, we, we, it's cost us 322. So now we're essentially marking the cow for 118, 875 uh, at 850. That's a thousand and ten dollar floor. Um, so where if we would have hedged those cattle, we were at 169 dollar profit, uh, and that's essentially what it was. Just our basis risk was what we had left in those. Um, 
now we've got $141 floor. So it essentially is costing us $28 in order to get some protection put in. Uh, so now our floor is at 141. But what it does for us is that it raises our ceiling. So if I hedge that cap, I'll make $169, it is what it is. But if I use this, uh, the, the put and call strategy, now I've raised my ceiling up to $253 a head. So is it worth $28 in order to raise your ceiling, uh, you know, another $85? Um, that's a decision that, like I said, it's personal. Everybody has to be able to make that decision on their own and figure out what's best for them. Um, so we, we do a lot of, um, we're going to do quite a bit of the buying puts and selling calls. Um, we're going to do some hedging. We're going to do a little bit of forward contracting. Uh, and, and every once in a while, we'll, we'll buy some calls uh, if we've hedged those cattle to open our ceiling back up. The one thing I would say and, and urge people is that, you know, once you have made your uh, initial risk management strategy, your risk management decision, that's not where it ends. Uh, this is something that, you know, you need to follow um, very closely all the way up until those cattle are marketed because there's going to potentially be opportunities in there to tweak that strategy or, or make some money here and then maybe forward contract those cattle or or cheapen up your position. There's there's things that we got to look at constantly to um, to put us in the best position. So um, I know some people just want to put it in place and walk away. I'd I'd urge you to stay hooked on it, uh, and because I think it could it could provide you some some real positive benefits. Um, the let me think if there's anything else that I was going to cover. The um, the, the one other thing that I was going to touch on is that, you know, just like Dan and Paul said this <clears throat> last year, last fall, boy, it was, I mean, you look at every cattle fax or any analyst report, it was rosy. I mean, we were going to make some money. And, and there's a lot of people that did not make money this past year. And, and I would say that it's, you know, that is exactly what risk management is for. Um, I think it's good. We need to stay up on what people's opinions are, where we, where we think the fundamentals are at and things like that. But ultimately, um, you know, it's our, it's our job as producers. It's our decision to make good financially responsible decisions. Um, and so, you know, if everybody in the world thinks that cattle are just going to keep going up, they may or they may not. Uh, nobody can guess that. Nobody can predict that. We're way, we're a lot, lot better at looking back, looking back at historical data and saying what happened. But nobody can tell you what these markets are going to do. And so, you know, that's where it's really important to have your head around the entire business and know you know, how much, how much can we stand to lose? How much risk can we take and stay solvent and be ready to go again next year? And so um, it's an incredibly important um, decision-making process that everybody needs to go through and, uh, and try, to, try to do what's best for their business. So that was pretty much it that I had. And, and hopefully we got any questions out there and hopefully I address what you wanted, Dave. Yeah, Brian. Paul. Um, I have a couple of questions here. One, um, how does weather affect your buying decisions? Um, similar to the weather we've experienced lately or, you know, uh, along with that, everybody just knows October is going to be um, National Dead Calf Month. So, I mean, do you have any <laughs> preconceived notions as, as far as season of the year um, affecting your buying or just the weather outlook for the upcoming you know, two, one or two week period. You know, it, it, I mean, it's gonna, it absolutely, 
if I'm going to buy a calf in October, he better margin better than one that I'm buying in December. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, because I do know that my costs are higher. So I'm, I'm not going to, I'll put it this way. There's never a time of the year that I'm going to say we're out of the market, but there are times of the year where I'm going to be a lot, the, the margins are going to have to get better. Um, and I'm not going to put as much pressure on myself because I know that in October, it's going to take a lot of labor to keep these cattle straight. And so where in October, maybe I go out and I'll buy a, a hundred a month or something, you know, just so I don't get overwhelmed. Whereas if I get into January, it doesn't bother me a bit to go out and buy four or 500 in a month. I mean, because I can, I know that I'm going to be able to get through the cattle. And so the, the weather and time of year absolutely um, has a bearing on what our buying decisions are. Um, if, if the, if we've, you know, I didn't buy any cattle for the last two weeks and, and it wasn't because of this storm that came in, it was because we'd kind of gotten where we thought we needed to be. But if, if last week I saw this thing forecasted, I wouldn't have been in the market. I mean, there's just, you know, the other part of this deal is, is kind of a psychological piece of it. Um, some people can really handle doctoring lots and lots of cattle and dragging off a lot of debts. Um, not everybody can either. And so that's one thing that when you're making all these decisions, you got to know what you can handle because I'll be honest with you, I've been dragging a lot more debts than I feel comfortable doing. The cattle will still make money. We're going to be okay, but it wears on you. It really does. And so um, that's one thing that just kind of goes into that decision-making process when it comes to weather and, and all that kind of stuff. So an, another question that was texted to me, how much time do you spend um, with your marketing and, and reanalysis of your uh, hedging and, and puts and calls? You know, it's in the past I've had talked to producers about, um, you know, uh, risk management and they say, well, I tried hedging one time and I, and it didn't work, or I tried a put and I didn't get anything out of it. Um, you know, but whenever we get in, you know, middle of receiving cattle and doctoring cattle and all that, or planting and we're busy, we don't take the time to sit in and do our, our uh, paperwork or, or, you know, manage the business. So how much time do you feel like you spend doing that and how do you make that balance? Well, I'll say that I'll say that I'm in a really good position in terms of I've, I've got, I mean, that my dad and I and, and our wife, my mom and my wife, we're all um, equally vested in the business now. And, and the thing is, is that he he still has a day job. Uh, he's still in an office about three days a week. Um, and so he's able to kind of crunch through this stuff pretty often. Um, and I'll say this is that the, just this meeting that we're having right now is a huge advancement in technology. And we have all of these things at our fingertips. Um, you know, when, when I worked in an office, I did a lot of computer stuff. I was on the computer all the time, building spreadsheets, figuring out ways to, to analyze and crunch all these numbers. And you know what I use now? I use my smartphone with my apps that help me get my prices and I use a piece of paper and a pen. <laughs> and, and I mean that, you know, we still have, even though it's hard to get in an office or sit down and do this, we have the technology available at our fingertips where we can just take a 10 minute break during the day and, and, and grab our piece of paper and our pen and start crunching a few of these numbers and see, well, you know, what's happened in this market and can we, what if we roll these cattle or what, you know, it, it doesn't take as much time as you really think it does, especially with the tools we have available now. So I would, I mean, obviously we know what the board's doing every day of the week. I mean, it's, it's close. It's easy to find out. Um, I'm going to say probably at least once a week, 
we're looking at all, it, looking at what everything is, how it's shaking out, and do we need to be making any decisions? And and it's not, you know, a lot of times you'll do it and you won't make a change, but but every once in a while you'll you'll see a move that that record that says, whoa, well, that's an opportunity there that we didn't have. And so, um, I, I I would I would encourage people probably, you know sure enough try to do it once a week if not once a week at least every couple of weeks just to stay up with with where everything's going okay got one last question before we end here uh, what are your thoughts on spring calving cows versus fall calvers uh, once they're yearlings and then selling them I, I think it means you know retaining calves in the you know weaned in the fall versus retaining calves weaned in the spring and and the options on marketing those are there anything different due to season to think about that a little bit um you know i mean on a spring spring calving herds i mean t that's where the the vast majority of our calves come from um so my my gut reaction there is that I think there's probably going to be typically on average more more money to be made on those cattle by retaining ownership um, so that you're not selling into the glut of all the other spring calvers in the world. Um, but that being said, you know, the, the decision making process is the same for both. Uh, and, and that's one of them deals where I think you, you got to be careful to not fall into doing the same thing because it, you know, it's just what you've gotten used to, because I've seen times where it makes money to wean a calf and, and to put some time into it and, and retain ownership and maybe turn it out on wheat or something like that. I've seen times where it doesn't work, uh, in both scenarios. So I, I'd say it, you know, Every year, the, the the process has to occur where we go through this this decision making and and determine what course of action we want to take. Um, you know, because boy, maybe that maybe that calf is worth way more money than it should be. You can go sell that calf, give a little bit of time, maybe the market calms back down, and then you can buy back in uh, if you want to go start a start a new calf. So um, that's. That's, I guess I, that's the best I can do on that. Thank you very Dan much. Dan might have another thought on that. Paul, I might just comment a couple of, a couple of things on that that uh, come, comes to mind. And, and that is, is that because what Brian said about the number or percent of our national cow herd that calves in the spring, uh, roughly 70 or better percent, if you if you look at the way that most of those calves when they come off in the fall, that from a from a, a feeder cattle and fed cattle seasonality perspective, that that calf is pre predominantly at the at the wrong weight most most of its life, uh, and and. You know, we we know that that typically the the fed fed market's better in March and April. Uh, you know, it's just hard to get a spring calving calf uh, finished in that time period. Most of the time, it's in June and July when that when that market goes down. A lot of a lot of producers will will uh, confess that well, you know, I can wean a a heavier calf from a born in the fall than I can in the spring, which is probably true. And so let's say we precondition that calf, sell it maybe in, in July after 45 days and we say, wow, you know, we can get a much higher price uh, for that animal in July than let's say a preconditioned calf from the spring born in November. And, and I would say they're spot on. However, you know, profit is revenue minus expenses. <laughs> and, and so we don't want to be lulled into thinking that if we're selling a higher price calf, that means more profit. 
because to you know for many people in Oklahoma, especially on the in central and western Oklahoma, that to to, to have a, a wet cow, lactating cow, in the in the winter and trying to get her bred in the winter is is quite expensive, and and so as we contemplate spring calving versus fall calving. Uh, it, it, we need to look at both sides of the equation, revenue as well as expenses, uh, because that's what that's what we can go to the go to the bank with. So that's maybe some considerations people might have. Thank you very much. Um, uh, once again, thank you for those great presentations. Um, we're, we're running short on time. We're actually over our normal allotted time. So um, thank you everybody for, for attending this meeting and, and um, staying with us all this time. Um, be sure and join us next week on November the 5th. We'll have Dr. Ryan Ruder uh, talk about uh, setting stocking rates uh, for wheat pasture calves and supplementation. We've, we've done some research here at, at the uh, uh, Oklahoma State University looking at that. We completed last year and he's going to touch on some of that. And it's years like this where we're, you know, you know, some years we may have a lot more forage than average. This year is going to be one of those where our, our wheat forage is delayed. So we can't go by those same rules of thumb every single year on, on stocking rate, whether that's just a number of pounds of beef per acre or, or a number of acres per calf. So um, uh, with that, uh, I think it's going to be a really interesting discussion next week as well. Uh, once again, thank you for attending and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, Brian and Dan. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, You're welcome. Brian.